In today's lesson, we're going to start a new unit, and um, it's going to be in Chapter 9 of your textbook. The name of the unit is Stoichiometry. Today, our lesson is going to focus on arithmetic of equations, and you can find this information in Section 9.1 of your textbook. The lesson essential question for this part of the unit is how does the mole serve as the central unit to calculate the amounts of products or reactants that are formed or used during a chemical reaction? There are a couple objectives of today's lesson. First, you're going to want to be able to use dimensional analysis or the fence post method to calculate the expected quantity of a substance. Um, and also calculate the mass in grams of reactants and products. And finally, determine which items in a chemical reaction are conserved. Believe it or not, chemistry is actually really applicable to industry in everyday life. And manufacturers use chemistry to not only create products, but they also have to make sure um, that they can actually create a profit when they try to sell these products. So they use things like equations in order to calculate the amount of cost to make a product and the amount of revenue that they're going to actually attain when they try to sell the product on the market. And no company, as I said before, would be successful without a good mathematician. So math is at the basis of both chemistry and also industry. So a company has to be able to make a profit in order to basically be successful and survive. And so the cost of making the items that they are creating has to be less than the price that they expect people to pay um, when they sell it on the market. So basically equations serve as uh, the foundation for industry, and chemistry is also a part of that industry and also the equations. Let's take a look at a real-life application of this concept. So silk is a precious fabric, and it's used to make um, very expensive clothing, and one type of clothing that it's known for are kimonos. And Silk is created by an animal that's called a silkworm, and there are 3,000 silkworms that are going to be needed in order to make a single Japanese kimono. So if you were in the industry of making kimonos, um, what you want to be able to do is to calculate the amount of worms that are needed to make a certain number, and in our case, we're going to say 11. Kimonos. So how many worms would it take to make 11 kimonos? And to figure this out, we're going to set up a basic equation. As I mentioned on the last slide, um, industries and even chemists use equations to predict the amount of products that can be produced for a certain reaction. So if our end goal would be uh, 11 kimonos, what we have to do is we have to look at the reactants of this equation, which would be the worms, and then we also have to figure out how many kimonos that would actually produce. And so what our goal was, if you forgot, was we wanted to make 11 kimonos. And so from that, if I know, for example, that it takes 3,000 worms per kimono, so for every one kimono, I'm going to need 3,000 silkworms. In order to figure out the number of worms I would need, I'm going to take 11 and I'm going to multiply it by 3,000. And that's going to tell me that I'm going to need a total of 33,000 worms in order to make... 11 kimonos. That's pretty astounding. So these people have to know what they're doing when they raise these silkworms because it takes so many just to produce a single kimono.
Throughout this lesson, we're going to look at a couple what I call key concept Q&A sessions, so question and answer. So here's your first one. How could a recipe for cookies be compared to a balanced chemical equation? So pause the video and think about that for about 30 seconds. The answer to this question is that a balanced chemical equation is going to tell us what we call quantitative information. So that's numerical information. It's not only going to tell us the numbers of reactants that we're going to need, things like flour and sugar and butter and eggs, and, but it's also going to tell us uh, the products, so like how many cookies, and the yield that we're going to expect. That's the number that we expect from that. So maybe one batch of cookies is going to give us two dozen um, individual cookies. So there's lots of information that you can actually use and compare from chemistry to everyday life, and actually there is a lot of chemistry in baking, um, and so when you think about that, you can actually apply the concepts of chemical reactions and what I call stoichiometry to other concepts besides just science. The field um, that deals with the calculation of quantities in chemistry and chemical reaction is a subject of chemistry that's called stoichiometry. And I've written stoichiometry in lots of fancy letters because this is actually my favorite topic to teach throughout the entire year. So we're going to talk about the mole concept again, and we're going to go from grams to moles to representative particles, but now we're going to change the substances. So instead of going from substance A to substance A, we're going to go from substance A to substance D. So if you're trying to create a certain amount of product, if you're given 20 grams of the reactants, now you can figure out how many grams of product you can actually produce from that reaction. In terms of chemical equations, this is super cool. If you know the quantity of only just one substance in a chemical reaction, you can actually calculate the amount in grams, moles, or representative particles of any other substance. It could be another reactant, it could be a product, um, and you can figure out how much of that is either used if it's a reactant, or you can figure out how much of the product should be theoretically produced from that reaction. So here's an example at the bottom. This is not one that you need to actually think about right now, but at the end of this unit, you should be able to answer this um, particular scenario. It says, um, you can calculate the amount of grams of ammonia, NH3, that are produced if you were going to have 12 grams of nitrogen react with hydrogen. So when we look at this, here is my equation. I'm going to take N2 and H2, and they're going to combine through a synthesis reaction to make NH3. Then I'm going to make sure that I have my equation balanced. So I'm going to put a 2 in front of the ammonia. Then I'm going to put a 1 in front of the nitrogen. And then finally, I'm going to put a 3 in front of the hydrogen. So now, if I have 12 grams of nitrogen, that means that I can figure out, actually, how many grams of ammonia could be produced, which is pretty cool. Again, this is not something that you're going to need to do today, but by the end of the chapter, it actually will be very familiar and very easy to you. And as you know already, in chemistry, we actually have our own units. So some of the common units that are used to measure matter in chemistry are things like grams. Grams are going to measure, um, they're going to measure mass. We also know that the central unit is the mole. So if you can get to moles in chemistry, you can get anywhere that you want to be. Moles are actually a unit of counting. And representative particles, these are things like atoms, molecules, or formula units. So I'll just write A, M, and F. And these are also a unit of counting. And then finally, 
Uh, liters of a gas at standard temperature and pressure can also be measured in chemistry a lot of times, and this one would be a unit of volume. Now, remember that our key heavy hitter here is actually the mole. So the mole is the central unit of chemistry, and I hope you remember my song. I'll post it again on the portal called Chemists Know, Chemists Know, about that number called the mole. And our famous guy that goes along with the mole is Amadeo Avogadro, and we're going to celebrate Mole Day on June 2nd. So make sure that you come prepared for that. So that magical number is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So we're going to talk about that number again. I have two definitions for the term stoichiometry. Sometimes stoichiometry is defined as um, the calculation of quantities of substances that are involved in chemical equations. The second definition is the portion of chemistry dealing with the numerical relationships in chemical reactions. And stoich literally in Latin means to count, and um, you're going to be counting atoms when you talk about stoichiometry. We talked about chocolate chip cookies before, so let's talk about them again. Um, everybody loves cookies, and uh, it's fun to make chocolate chip cookies. So let's talk about stoichiometry being applied to a chocolate chip cookie recipe. When you think about a recipe sort of um, like an equation, what you're going to get are the ingredients, the stuff that you start with, things like the unsalted butter, the brown sugar, uh, the sh regular sugar, um, and, you know, eggs and flour and so on. Those are going to be your reactants. The products of this equation would be the cookies, the things that you are going to have when you're done uh, with this particular equation or reaction. But also, one thing that we're going to talk about later on in the chapter is what's called the yield or the percent yield or the theoretical yield versus the actual yield. So there is a theoretical yield in most recipes, and what I have um, is in the top right, I have actually boxed the yield. This particular recipe is going to be expected to yield two dozen cookies or 24. Now, that doesn't always happen. It sort of depends upon the size of the cookie that you make. So sometimes that doesn't happen in chemistry either. That's the difference between what we call the theoretical yield, the yield that is expected if everything goes correctly, um, versus what's called the actual yield, the real amount of substance that you get as a product. So we'll talk about that later on. Let's take a look at a practice problem that's going to deal with stoichiometry and um, cookies. So it says if one batch of chocolate chip cookies is going to make two dozen, and that's one thing that we know. So we know that um, two dozen is equal to 24 cookies. It says how many batches would you need to make in order to produce a mole of cookies. So the other thing you're going to need to know is what a mole is defined as. And what we know is that one mole of any substance is going to have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd representative particles, which in this case are going to be cookies. It's just the individual item. So we're going to set this up by actually starting with the mole. And so I'm actually going to convert that right away to um, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd cookies. That's one mole of cookies. So I want to know basically how many batches I'm going to have to make. So what I know is that there are 24 cookies that are expected for each batch that I have. And so when I cross out my units, what I'm going to get is my cookies are going to cancel each other out, 
and I should be left with batches. And so when I take, remember to use parentheses when you do this, so you're going to take uh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, you multiply it by 1, and then divide it by the number 24. And when you do that, you're going to figure out that you're going to have to make a lot of cookies uh, and a lot of batches. So it's going to be 2.51 times 10 to the 22nd batches, not even just cookies, but that's the number of batches of cookies that you're going to have to make. So um, you better get started. That's a lot of batches. So just think about the concept of the mole and get familiar with it again. If you need to review it, you can find that information in previous lessons. Now let's look at stoichiometry in another real-world wonderful application, the application of tricycles. So let's imagine that you work for a tricycle company, and for simplicity's sake, we're going to simplify what a tricycle is composed of, uh, and we're also going to abbreviate each item with a capital letter. So let's say that each tricycle is composed of one frame, which will be F, one seat, which will be S, three wheels, which will be W, one handlebar, which will be H, and two pedals, which will be P. So let's say that you wanted to write an equation that's going to show the formation of a tricycle in terms of a chemical reaction. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually first going to write um, the symbols for each item above the picture, and then we'll get started. So the very first thing that I have is going to be the frame. We have a single one of those. We have a single seat, which is going to be S, but we're going to have um, not a single wheel. We're actually going to have three wheels. So I'm going to write 3W for three wheels. We're going to add it to one set of handlebars, which is H, and two pedals. So I'm going to write 2P. Now the hard part about this is to figure out how do you make the equation for the tricycle. And what ends up happening is that your coefficients are going to end up becoming your subscript. So in a way, you can kind of look at the 3 as coming down here and the 2 coming down here. So when you're done, I'm just going to erase that so that I don't have too much on the screen. And when you're done, you're going to get a tricycle, and the formula for our tricycle would then be F, S, W3, that's the subscript, H, P, 2. And so I'm just going to rewrite this equation down at the bottom. So if we took F plus S plus 3W plus H plus 2P, we would get a tricycle, and the tricycle would have the formula of F, S, W3, H, P2. And that's going to be our fake equation. So there's one important concept um, that you're probably picking up, and that's going to be what happens to the coefficient when you take it to the other side. So this is just a generic example. It actually is kind of easier when you're given chemical substances and you have molar masses and stuff like that. It makes a little bit more sense when you have real items and real numbers. Let's take a look at our second practice problem. It says that each day, 128 tricycles have to be made. So it's your job to make sure that there are enough available parts at the start of each day in order to meet this quota. The question is, how many of each part um, are you going to need at the beginning of each day in order to create 128 uh, fully functioning tricycles? So we're going to look at the frames, the seats, the wheels, and the handlebars, and the pedals. You can see the practice problem up top in blue, but let's just go over each of these. So um, each tricycle is going to need one frame, and if we need 128 tricycles, that's going to be 128 frames. And each tricycle is also going to have one seat, 
and if we have 128 tricycles, we would also need 128 seats. Um, but for each tricycle, we don't need one wheel, we're gonna need three. That's why it's called a tricycle. So we're gonna need three times 128, and that is going to be 384 wheels. The number of handlebars per tricycle is one, and if we need 128, that's gonna be 128 H. And then finally, there are two pedals that are needed per tricycle. And so we are gonna take the number two, and we're going to multiply that by 128, and our subtotal of pedals is going to be 256 Ps. So those are the items that you would need to meet the quota at the beginning of each day. Let's keep going with the concept of tricycles in stoichiometry. So let's say that each five-day week, your company must make 640 tricycles. How many wheels need to be in the plant on Monday morning in order to meet this quota on Friday? So what you're going to do is you're going to write your substances in terms of chemical formulas and also be sure to show how these units are going to cancel out. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to basically replace tricycles with uh, the formula that we used for tricycles, which was F S W3 H P2. And then for the wheels, we're going to write just W. So let's set up our problem. You can see the problem in blue at the top, right underneath where it says practice problem. So what we're given in this problem is we are basically told that there are 640 tricycles that are going to need to be made. But instead of writing tricycles out, we're going to write it as the equation that we created earlier. So we need 640, and our formula is going to be F S W3 H P2. That's basically code name for a tricycle. And what we know is that for every one tricycle, or for every one what we call F S W3 H P2, there is going to be three wheels or three W's that are required. And so when I set this up, my FSW3 HP2s are going to cancel each other out, and I'll be left with W's. So I'm going to take 640, and I'm going to multiply it by the number 3. So our math looks like this, 640 times the number three, and then we're gonna divide it by the number one. And what we're going to figure out is that the number of wheels that have to be in the plant on Monday morning are going to be 1,920 wheels. And that's gonna be our answer. Remember to circle and label your answer, especially when you have lots of work. Let's have another Q&A session here for key concepts. So when we think about interpreting different chemical equations, one thing you want to think about is what types of information can a balanced chemical equation actually tell you? So pause the video and take about 30 seconds just to think about that and see what you come up with. So think about quantities that we've used in chemistry in the past. Some of the quantities that we've talked about in the past are things like mass. We usually measure mass in a unit that we call grams. We've also talked about moles. Moles are the central unit of chemistry. Um, they're a unit of counting. And we've talked about representative particles, which are also a unit of counting. And we had atoms, molecules, and formula units. And then finally, we've also talked briefly about volume. We're going to look a little bit more into volume in this chapter um, later on when we talk about liters of a gas at standard temperature and pressure.
In order to look at some of the types of information that chemical equations can tell you, we're going to use the reaction of the formation of ammonia, which we talked about earlier in this lesson. So the balanced equation is if you actually have 1N2 plus 3H2 is going to give us 2NH3. So let's think about the kinds of information that we can actually interpret from a chemical reaction using this particular equation. We're going to think about things like uh, mass. We're going to talk about things like uh, volume, meaning the volume of gases at STP. We're going to talk about representative particles like moles or uh, molecules and things like that. Let's start off with uh, particles. So when we talk about particles, the way that you determine the number of particles for each type of atom is by taking the coefficient multiplied by the subscript. And this is how we balanced equations. So um, in terms of looking at the left and the right and making sure you have the same number of each type of atom. So on the left, we're going to have two atoms of nitrogen, but on the right, we also have two atoms of nitrogen. Um, in terms of the hydrogen, you're going to get six atoms of hydrogen. So it's three times two on the left, and on the right, it's going to be two times three. And so when we look at the ratio of atoms, we're going to get um, a ratio of two to six, which is also a simplified ratio would be one to three. But one thing that's kind of important to realize is that atoms are actually going to be conserved during a chemical reaction. So this is the law of conservation of matter. So that means that if there are two atoms of nitrogen on the left, you're gonna have to have two atoms of nitrogen on the right. Atoms can't be simply created or destroyed. They have to just be rearranged and they have to appear on both sides. So one thing you need to remember also is that atoms really aren't super convenient to measure in because they're super duper tiny. So it would be practically impossible to pull off single atoms from things because that's not the way that things work. They're just too tiny. So we need another unit that we're gonna talk about in the future that's gonna help us use something that's more practical. Let's talk about molecules. So Molecules can actually be determined by looking at the coefficient of substances. So the coefficient are these numbers that come before the substance. Now, this number can tell you two things. You can look at it in terms of the representative particle, in terms of the molecules or formula units, but you can also look at it, which we're going to see in the next slide, when you're talking about moles. And so... Um, it's sort of like this is a one, even though it's imaginary. When you talk about these, you're going to be looking at the coefficient of chemical equations or balanced equations. So on the left, what we say is we have one molecule of nitrogen is going to react with three molecules of hydrogen to give us two molecules of ammonia. One thing that you'll probably notice is that these are not conserved, not like atoms. So just because you're going to have a certain number on the left of molecules or formula units on the reactant side, it doesn't mean that you're going to get that number on the product side. Now, molecules are also super duper tiny. So again, these are going to be impractical to measure and do reactions with. So we have to get something that's like a bigger bundle. So let's take a look at our next unit. And you might have guessed the practical unit is going to be the mole. So moles are actually a really good way to measure things that are super duper tiny like atoms and molecules and formula units. Now, again, moles are kind of like the coefficients. So if we have a one here, it, we would say that we have one mole of nitrogen that's going to combine with three moles of hydrogen in order to produce two moles of ammonia. These are practical units, but again, just like the representative particles, because they're the same number, those coefficients, you'll see that they're not necessarily conserved when you go from the reactant side of an equation to the product side. But they are practical.
Another way that we have measured matter is in mass in grams. And so when you try to calculate this, you're going to use molar masses. And what you're going to do first is you're going to calculate the molar mass of each substance. And we're going to do a practice problem that's going to reflect this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the molar mass for N2. So if I know that the mass of nitrogen is 14.0, I'm going to multiply that by the number 2, and I'm going to get 28.0 grams, and then I multiply that by the coefficient. And so I would take, let me just draw an arrow here, I'm going to take 1, because that's kind of like the coefficient for nitrogen, and I'm going to multiply it by 28 grams per mole, and what I would get from that is 28. So that's going to be the mass in grams of nitrogen. And then for hydrogen, you would take the molar mass, so we have H would be 1 times 2 would be 2, and then we're going to take the coefficient times the molar mass, which is going to be 3 times 2 to give us 6. And so the mass of hydrogen would be 6.0. And then if you add those two together, you're going to get the number 34. So on the reactant side, you're going to have 34 grams of reactants when you take 28 and you add it to 6. And then what we're going to do is if we were to find the molar mass of ammonia, so um, the nitrogen is going to be 14 times 1, and that's going to be 14.0. And then the hydrogen would be 1 times 3, which is going to be 3. And when I take the subtotal of that, I'm going to get 17. But then I have to multiply it by the coefficient, which is going to be 2. So I'm going to take 2 times 17, and that's actually going to equal 34. So that's going to be the mass in grams of the product. So one thing you'll notice is that mass from reactants to products is actually going to be conserved, which is going to come up later on in our lesson. The last unit of measurement for matter that we're going to look at is volume of a gas at STP. So what we learned about Avogadro's hypothesis is that one mole of any gas at standard temperature and pressure is going to occupy the same amount of volume. So that magical volume of one mole would occupy 22.4 liters of gas. And so at standard temperature and pressure, if the coefficient for the nitrogen is the number 1, so when we look at our balanced equation, uh, it's kind of like saying a 1 here. So that one's going to be 22. That's 1 mole. Remember, the coefficients are going to tell us how many moles of the substance that we're going to have. So I would take the number 1 times this number 22.4. And then the coefficient for hydrogen is the number 3. And so I would get... 3 times 22.4 for the amount of gas for the hydrogen in terms of uh, the volume in liters. And then for the ammonia, it's going to be 2 times 22.4. And so on the left-hand side, in terms of nitrogen, we're going to get 22.4 liters of nitrogen. It's going to combine with uh, 3 times 22.4 which is going to be 67.2 liters of hydrogen in order to form 44.8 liters, which would be 2 times 22.4 liters of ammonia. So all I'm doing for this to calculate this is I'm going to take the coefficient and I'm going to multiply it by the number 22.4 liters in order to figure out how many of each substance in liters that I have. So um, you will notice that the volume is not going to be conserved necessarily from the reactant to the product side. Let's see if you were paying attention. So which quantities in chemical reactions are going to be conserved and which ones are not going to be conserved. So there should be two uh, quantities that we've talked about today that are actually conserved. Think about that and see if you can come up with the answer.
The first quantity that's going to be conserved in any balanced chemical equation are the number of atoms. So this is why we balance equations. You have to obey the law of conservation of matter, which says that you have to have the same number of each type of atom on the reactant side that you have on the product side. The second item that's going to be conserved in a chemical reaction are the mass of the reactants and the mass of the products. So when you calculate the total mass in grams of reactants, it's going to have to equal the total mass in grams of the products when you add them together. Um, and this is actually the law of the conservation of mass. And so we're going to look at some example problems that demonstrate that atoms and mass are going to be conserved during any balanced chemical reaction. Let's take a look at a practice problem. So it says that hydrogen sulfide is a foul smelling gas and it's going to be found in nature in volcanic areas. The balanced equation for burning hydrogen sulfide is listed below. So it's 2H2S plus o 3O2 and it's going to give us uh, 2SO2 and 2H2O. So we want to interpret this equation in terms of the interaction of atoms and then the number of representative particles. In this case, we're going to have molecules. Uh, and the reason that we have molecules is because we have covalently bonded substances. And also the number of moles. The moles are going to be the coefficients um, along with the representative particles. And then finally, the masses of the reactants and the products. So let's take a look at each one of these individually. During any chemical reaction, um, atoms are something that are conserved. And so to calculate the number of atoms of each element, the formula that we use is we're going to take the coefficient and we are going to multiply it by the subscript. And you're familiar with this from balancing equations in our last chapter. So for example, to calculate the number of hydrogens on the left side, I would take two and I multiply it by two and I'm going to get four. So we have four hydrogens on the left. In terms of the sulfur on the left, we would take 2 and we're going to multiply it by the number 1 and we're going to get 2 atoms of sulfur on the left. In terms of oxygen I would take 3 and I'm going to multiply that by 2 and I find that my subtotal of oxygens on the left is going to be 6. So now let's go over to the right side of the equation. We should get the same numbers um, but one thing you might have to realize is that you're going to have two different substances that have oxygen, so we're going to have to add them together when we're done. So for the sulfur, I'm going to take 2, and I'm going to multiply that by 1, and that's going to give me 2. Um, for the oxygen, I'm going to have to go to both substances. So one substance, I'm going to write this just right underneath here, so one substance is going to have 2 times 2, and that would be 4. And then the other substance for the oxygen is going to have 2 times 1, and that's going to be the number 2. And then I have to add them together, and that's going to be 6. And so my number of oxygens on the right is going to be 6. And then finally, my number of hydrogens is going to be 2 times 2, and that's going to be the number 4. So what you'll see is that for each item we should get the same numbers. On the left there's 4 hydrogens, on the right 4 hydrogens, left 2 sulfurs, right 2 sulfurs, and left 6 oxygens, and then right 6 oxygens. Part B asked us to look at the number of representative particles or the number of molecules of each substance. And this is actually really easy. All we have to do is look at the coefficients of each substance. So that's what we have to look at in order to determine the number of RPs. So what we would say is that we're going to have uh, two molecules of H2S. We're going to have three molecules of O2. 
um, and we're going to get two molecules of SO2 and also two molecules of H2O. So we're talking about molecules as our RP in this case because we're going to have uh, compounds that have covalent bonds and non-metals. Part C asked us to look at the coefficients in terms of uh, moles. And so what we're going to look at in this case is also going to be the coefficients. Coefficients tell us both the representative particle and also the molar quantity. So it's like zooming in and zooming out. When we talk about moles, that's at the big level. When we talk about RPs, that's at the tiny level. So we're again going to look at these coefficients. And you can see the answer below that we're going to have uh, two moles of H2S that are going to react with three moles of O2 in order to form two moles of SO2 and also two moles of H2O. Part D asked us to look at the mass values of reactants and products. So what we know is that mass is conserved because we have the law of conservation of mass, which says that the sum of the masses of the reactants in any chemical equation must equal the sum of the masses of the products. And in order to prove this to yourself, you're going to need knowledge of molar mass. And you know how to do this. You're going to use the periodic table and the substance that you have. Remember to round your uh, digits to one place to the right of the decimal when we calculate molar mass mass. Now, the other thing that we're going to do, which you maybe aren't familiar with yet, is um, we're going to also multiply each molar mass by the coefficient in order to get the numbers of each item that we have on the reactant side and the product side, but we'll get there eventually. So let's start off with the concept of molar mass of each substance, and then we'll look at the second step. Now, the one thing that you're going to notice here is that we're only looking at the reactant side when we look at this slide. So that's kind of important. So this is just the left side of the e equation. So I'm going to write that here, reactant side of the equation. So we're only looking at it basically up to here. So when we talk about the molar mass of H2S, um, to calculate that, you're going to take hydrogen, which is 1. You multiply it by 2 atoms, and then you're going to find that sulfur is 32.1. We're going to multiply that by 1 atom. And what you're going to get for the molar mass of um, H2S is going to be 34.1 grams per mole. But what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the molar mass by the coefficient. So this is the coefficient, the 2, that's this guy right here. And we're going to multiply that by the molar mass of the substance in order to get basically the total molar mass of that substance. So that's going to be the subtotal for 2H2S. It's going to be 68.2 grams. Um, and then we're going to look at the molar mass of oxygen. So to do that, each oxygen weighs 16 grams per mole, but we have two of them, so that's going to be 32 grams per mole. And again, we're going to take the coefficient, which is 3, and we're going to multiply that by the molar mass, which was 32, and that's going to be 96.0. So to calculate the subtotal of the mass of the reactants, we're going to take uh, 68.2, sorry, I forgot my 0.2 there, and we're going to add it to 96.0, and we're going to get 164.2 grams. These are going to be the grams of the reactants, okay? So now we're going to have to look at the grams of the products. Now, I'm just going to write this up here. This is only going to be the product side of the reaction. Or the equation. So when we look at this, we're going to be looking basically from here over. All right, let's talk about the molar mass of SO2. S has a molar mass of 32.1. I'm going to multiply that by the number 1. 
And then for oxygen, it's 16, but I have two atoms of it, so that gets multiplied by two to make 32. When I add that together, we're going to get 64.1 grams per mole, but I have to remember that I have not one, but I actually have two moles of SO2. So the two is the coefficient, and we're gonna multiply that by the molar mass of the substance, which is 64.1 grams, and when we calculate that, we're going to get um, 128.2 grams of SO2. Let's move on to water. So water, the hydrogen is one. We have two atoms of it to make two, and then we add it to 16 for the mass of oxygen times one, which is 16, and we get that each water molecule is going to have 18 grams per one mole. So one mole of water is going to weigh 18 grams, but according to this equation, we don't have one mole, we have two. Um, so this is your coefficient. And we're gonna multiply that by the molar mass again, and we're gonna get 36 grams of water. So now when I add up the uh, subtotals of my products, I'm gonna take 128.2 grams from the SO2 and 36 grams from the water, and I'm gonna get 164.2 grams of products. Here's a summary of each uh, molar mass items that we have, the mass of each reactant, um, and then the mass of the reactants, and then the mass of each product, and then the mass of the products all together. And what we're going to see is that the total mass of reactants ends up being 164.2 grams, and the total mass of the products also ends up being 164.2 grams. And so what we know from this is that mass is actually conserved, but you have to make sure that that chemical equation is actually balanced. That is definitely key. So if you don't have a balanced equation, you're not in good shape to get started with actually comparing stuff. All right, that's going to actually be the end of this particular lesson, looking at information and interpreting chemical reactions. Before we end our lesson today, we're just going to do a quick uh, review of vocabulary and also a summary of the lesson. We had lots of terms today in our lesson. Some are new, some are old. Um, we talked about stoichiometry, we talked about an equation, we talked about reactants and products and a yield. Um, we also talked about units that are used to measure matter, things like uh, mass in grams, moles, which are a unit of counting, representative particles, which are also unit of counting and come in the form of either atoms, molecules, or formula units. And then we also talked about liters, which are used to represent units of volume. We've talked about the term coefficient before, and remember that coefficients can be used to look at mole quantities or representative particle quantities. And then at the end of the lesson, we talked about molar mass and also the law of conservation of mass. We started off the lesson talking about stoichiometry, which is the mathematics of chemical equations, and it's used to quantify substances such as reactants and products. It's also used to make calculations and predictions about how many reactants and products are either used or formed during a chemical reaction. We also know that chemical substances are commonly measured in units of mass that we use as grams, units of counting, which are either moles or representative particles that can come in the forms of atoms if you have an element, molecules if you have a covalently bonded compound, or formula units if you have an ionically bonded compound. And also our last unit is a liter. Liters are used to typically measure volume.
The most important unit in chemistry is the mole because it's the central unit. It allows you to convert into any of the other units that you're trying to get to. Um, the coefficients of a balanced equation can tell us something about the mole if you're looking at macroscopic uh, levels of the equation in chemical substances. But coefficients can also sort of zero in and tell us either the number of molecules or the number of formula units that a particular sub substance has. And we looked at each of these substances that we just mentioned a couple slides ago. We looked at atoms, and we looked at moles, and representative particles, and we looked at liters, and mass, and things like that. But what we learned from this particular lesson, when we examined the arithmetic of equations, is we learned that there are two items that are conserved during any chemical reaction, and those two things are going to be atoms and mass. And we also learned that things like moles, representative particles, are not necessarily conserved, but atoms and mass are because of the law of conservation of matter and the law of conservation of mass. Up next, we're going to look at an introduction to calculating what I call mass-to-mass -mass calculations. Thanks so much for listening today, and keep practicing your chemical reactions.